does sound a lot like Nope. Sorry. <laughs> well, good morning. Welcome to Santa Barbara Community Church. Will you please stand and join us in worship? all the hosts of heaven who else can make every king bow down who else can whisper and darkness trembles only a holy God what are the beauty demands such praises Shines the sun. And what of the majesty rules with justice? Only a holy God. Come and behold him, the one and the only. Cry out, sing all. Amen. Amen. Good to be together. Welcome to Santa Barbara Community Church. And whether you're joining us online or, or on the patio, we're so excited to be together. 
united as one body of Christ. I'm going to read the lyrics of the next song we're going to sing, uh, and I ask you just to reflect on these words. No sky contains, no doubt restrains all you are, the greatness of our God. I spend my life to know, and I'm far from close to all you are, the greatness of our God. As you reflect on those lyrics, I'd like to nudge us with just two simple goals or, or aspirations for our time together this morning. Firstly, just to acknowledge the absolute greatness of our God and truly respond in our hearts with authentic praise and worship. And number two, to acknowledge that we are far from close to comprehending the greatness of this God that we worship and, and to come ready to learn a little bit more about him here today. So let's take a moment. Let's, let's soften our hearts and prepare to worship God and hear from God today. from close. 
Amen. Amen. Well, go ahead and have a seat. Thank you. Amen. Well, again, good morning. Welcome to Santa Barbara Community Church. My name is Benji. I'm one of your lead pastors, and that is a joy and a privilege for me. Another joy and privilege we've had during this season of church life is to get to hear directly from some of our ministry partners, whether those are local partners or global partners. And today we have the privilege of being joined by Tom and Maddie Hardiman, and I am just really thrilled for you to get to hear a little bit of update on what it is that they are up to. We have supported Tom and Maddie as a church for a long time. In fact, Trinity Baptist Church was their sending church, and they served in Japan and then most recently in the Philippines, but find themselves in a time of transition, and they are here to tell us a little bit about how God is leading them in the midst of that, and so thanks for, thanks for being here. Thank you, Benji. It's awesome to be here. We are both adult missionary kids ourselves, and so to have a place like this church and this community that feels like home is a significant thing, and we thank you for that. And we have been, uh, we were 14 years in Japan, and then God called us, we went out in 92, then God called us from there to the Philippines, and uh, 14 years later, he called us here, and so we don't know if we're here for 14 years, but we're trying to see what God has for us as we've transitioned. And part of that transition was coming to the end of a, um, a relationship with the school. I was working as the head of school at Faith Academy, School for the Children of Missionaries there. And uh, two years ago, we had a report of a, a Me Too situation with a longtime 34-year employee that um, I was in charge of following through on what to do with that. And the board um, clearly had an interest in this. And we fell down and fell out in different places in the end of that investigation where it turned out that the um, accusations were unfounded, but the board wanted to move in one direction, and I really wanted to move in another. And it, it took us in a different place, uh, so much so that at the end of that 13th year, they said, you know, Tom, we're going to be looking for another head of school, but we'd like you to stay on for the 14th year if you're willing to do that. And that was a challenge at that point to say, God, is that what you want us to do, or do you want us just to leave now? And I was really encouraged. We felt God saying, no, stay on. But the further challenge was, you know, you need to serve with joy, whatever the circumstance. And uh, there's a book by Warren Wearsby, Be Joyful, that was written back in 1978. And it fell into my hands just at that time. And reading that was a real encouragement to me to stay the course and be joyful. And I have to report, uh, not by anything that I could do, but in leaving, I was on great terms with the board still a year later. And... Uh, that's by the grace of God. Mm -hmm. So you came to Santa Barbara. You've been here for about a year now in a time of discernment. Tell us a little bit about that time. What, what is it that you are factoring into as you think about what's next? And then tell us what's next. Why don't you? Sure. <laughs> um, family. Family is important. We have six kids. And as, we, uh, as they grew up and went off to college... Two of our first four went to college, and we just said goodbye. Hope you have a good time. You know, <laughs> here, we're way over here, and you're way over there. But we know God will meet your needs. And God did bring families along to be family for them and friends. Um, and then two of our kids landed with one with a family member and one with friends um, to start their working careers. They didn't want to go to college, but they had someone that they could go and live with and um, be able to start out in that way. But then we come to our fifth and sixth children. Um, our fifth just graduated from high school, and he's going to take a little bit longer to launch than the others did. And so we were really agonizing, God, how do we help him? How can we be with him? And we were scheduled for this one year to be with him, but we thought it might take longer than that. Um, and then our, uh, our other daughter, who's sitting way over there in the corner, <laughs> um, also had uh, interests and needs. And she's really enjoying going to Goleta Valley Junior High. And she's very interested in becoming a dermatologist at this point. Who knows how many times that will change over the next years. But, you know, we, 
we just really saw that in this year, God was meeting our needs as a family Mm -hmm. and giving us time to be together as a family. Most of our older grown children live here also. And so we have tacos every Sunday after church. Um, And they all come. And we just really saw that God was making a place for us to be their parents again in a season. Mm -hmm. And so we hoped that God would let us stay here. And there has been an amazing opportunity to be able to still be in missions, but to be able to stay in our kids' lives more present in the moment. Yeah, so what does that opportunity look like as you plan to stay here in Santa Barbara, but stay connected with the work of the global church? A couple of different opportunities have come up that God has placed uh, before me, working with an organization called Association of Christian Schools International. Uh, They had someone retiring in June and uh, starting in July. Uh, I'll be working as the Director of Strategic Development for Asia, which translates to working with the national directors of ACSI in those countries of Indonesia, Korea, and the Philippines to help them um, manage the schools, the Christian schools in those countries. Mm -hmm. So it's a wonderful opportunity to really help invest in the next generation of the church and the leaders in those areas. And then our mission, um, OC International, One Challenge, um, decided that they have uh, need to have a director of a child safety person, uh, child safety director. This is a new role, clearly, and uh, it's something that as time has gone on, there's been a a greater awareness of a need to intentionally have child safety policy in place and practices that um, most churches in America have, but international settings and teams often have not cared for so intentionally. So that will be my role with the mission um, starting in January 2022. And uh, the thing about both of those, I'll do some travel to support the teams that we have in our mission and the national directors in those uh, locations, but we're able to remain here stationed in, uh, situated in Goleta, lovely Goleta. So in the midst of a couple of really difficult years of trying to figure out what was coming from God's hand and his provision, what have you learned maybe about God, maybe about yourselves, maybe about the church? Um, I had a much harder time than Tom did with um, forgiveness, feeling hurt in the last couple of years, and the situation of being hurt by other Christians, and just really having to work that through. But we really found that God was with us, that God didn't let go of us, um, and we had lots of support in the community, but it was a situation where you had to walk, tread so carefully. You couldn't say what was really happening because it would cause division in the community, so we had to keep quiet about our, our feelings and situations, but God was with us, and God helped us with the forgiveness part and the living together in community with people who have hurt you. Um, so that was growing. <laughs> stretching and growing. And for myself, I think um, coming to the the experience of saying, I'm praying for hours on end about what's the the right thing to do and coming to the conclusion that this is the right thing to do, but then not having it turn out the way that you would like it to or expect it to. And in the end, realizing, you know, God is sovereign and he could have changed the board's mind. He could have taken a lot of different directions, But it gave me a real peace to say, okay, God, it's clearly your hand is involved here and we'll go because that's where you're leading us. Well, I just want to say I've enjoyed having you in our home group this year and watching you walk through this with a lot of joy and a lot of expectancy to see God's faithfulness and goodness has been really instructive for me and I think really a blessing. And so I thank you for your spirit of integrity and willingness to trust God, even as you have walked through some challenging stuff that wasn't immediately clear where it was heading. And so church, let's thank Tom and Maddie. We are going to pray together. I'm going to pray for Tom and Maddie and many other things as well. So I'm going to give words to this prayer, but invite you to join your heart as we pray together. And we're going to use the words of Psalm 97 to give a frame and a voice. The Lord reigns. Let the earth be glad. Let the distant shores rejoice. 
Clouds and thick darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes before him and consumes his foes on every side. His lightning lights up the world. The earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. The heavens proclaim his righteousness and all peoples see his glory. All who worship images are put to shame. Those who boast in idols worship him, all you gods. Zion hears and rejoices and the villages of Judah are glad because of your judgments, Lord. For you, Lord, are the most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. Let those who love the Lord hate evil, for he guards the lives of his faithful ones and delivers them from the hand of the wicked. Light shines on the righteous and joy on the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, you who are righteous, and praise his holy name. Lord God, we gather here this morning aware of your goodness. We are reminded in Tom and Maddie's story, we are reminded in this psalm that you are a God of greatness. We echo the psalmist this morning and declare that you, Lord, are the most high over all the earth. The psalm rehearses reasons for your people to give you praise. And here this morning, we want to add our voices. And so church, I want to encourage you to shout out loudly, what are our reasons we have to give praise to God? Let's praise him here this morning. For these reasons and innumerable others, we give you praise. And the psalm reminds us that your greatness and your glory are the fuel for our joy. Light shines on the righteous and joy on the upright in heart. Lord, we thank you for our friends and ministry partners, the Hardemans, that they have embodied joy in the face of challenges. And Lord, we thank you for the gifts of your spirit that have arisen even out of such a difficult transition, a confidence in your sovereignty, your spirit working the gift of forgiveness into hearts that might have been tempted to go a different direction. Lord, time and again, you have shown yourself faithful and trustworthy in their lives. And we praise you for the direction and provision you have given them again. We pray your blessing on their new endeavors that the character of your kingdom would be extended through Tom's new work avenues and through their time of caring intentionally for their family. Lord, would you be exalted and glorified and would little pieces of their world look more and more like the kingdom of heaven because of their faithfulness to you. And Lord, even as we praise you for guiding the Hardemans through a season full of challenges, some among us are living in the middle of challenges and still awaiting your provision or your direction, physical health crises, or mental health crises, economic insecurity, relational brokenness. Our spiritual family is walking each of these roads, and we are aware again of our need for you. And we confess that it is okay to not be okay, because it's only as we embrace that truth that we meet your grace. Would you show yourself true to your promise in this psalm that he guards the lives of his faithful ones? We pray this for Jack Dawson and John Rowe and Cindy Hadidian in their fights against cancer. For Michelle Smith as she faces surgery. For Sandy McOwen's continued recovery. We pray especially for your nearness and guarding power for Annie Gupta, grieving the death of her father. And for Barb Loomer, grieving the death of her sister. Lord, would you administer comfort by the power of your Holy Spirit? Lord, this psalm makes clear your intolerance of injustice and wickedness. And we know all too well that we live in a world that is ravaged by sin and the effects of the fall. This week, even as we saw a measure of justice done in a courtroom in Minneapolis, we lament the ongoing injustice that plays out on the streets of our country. 
disproportionately affecting black, brown, and Asian communities in ways that are often difficult for those who look like me to recognize. But Lord, this psalm insists that righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Would you bring true justice to our land and use your people to help dismantle structures and ways of thinking and acting that do not look like your kingdom? And would you empower your people to be ambassadors of a different kingdom than the kingdoms of this world? Would we live out the psalmist's plea, let those who love the Lord hate evil and give us a holy discontent to never settle until we see your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Finally, Lord, the psalm declares about you that the heavens proclaim his righteousness and all peoples see his glory. Lord, we pray to those ends as Steve will come to teach us from your word. Thank you for his giftedness, for his years of faithful service to our spiritual family. Again this morning, would you anoint his lips and honor his preparation so that we may better see your glory today and having seen it, be better able to live as your people in the midst of a world that you love and are working to redeem. We pray all of this through the Son and by the Spirit. Amen. Well, in just a moment, one of our founding pastors, Steve Jolly, is going to come and open the word for us, and we are looking forward to that. Two quick announcements for you. First is, if you are registered for Foundations, it's meeting right after this. Just a reminder, after this service, you can head to the back patio in that direction. Love to see you there if you are one of those people that registered for Foundations today. One of the high points of the church calendar every year, at least in our church calendar, is our church retreat, and we have not done it in far too long. So friends, I have a save the date for you. October 1st through 3rd, we are looking forward to having our church retreat. So we have um, the Salvation Army Camp down in Malibu booked, and we are thinking through how to do that in a way that will allow us to do all the things we love about the church retreat, to play together, to pray, to worship, to just simply be the church together. More details to come, obviously, so be on the lookout for that. But right now, you can save the date, October 1st through 3rd. Can't wait to church retreat with you. Steve, would you come and teach us as we wrap up our time in 1 Corinthians? You could uh, grab your Bibles or your devices, turn to 1 Corinthians as we uh, wrap up our study here. We've started in 1 Corinthians way back in September, and uh, we're going to finish it up here today. The last couple of weeks has really been the climax in chapter 15 of uh, th this great letter to the church in Corinth. And uh, we've seen in, those, in that chapter uh, the resurrection of Christ, the teaching of his conquering of death, and then uh, consequently the fact that we look forward to a wonderful resurrection in our life, a, a bodily existence where all our pains and sorrows will be gone. And it's really the climax not only of this letter to the church at Corinth, but the climax really, I, I believe, of our faith. And so we spent two weeks looking at that, and you could come to chapter 16 and think, well, uh, what's there left to say? Uh, we eagerly await their resurrection of Christ, the return of Christ and our resurrection, and there's really not much to do. And Paul, in a sense, in chapter 16, is saying to the church in Corinth and also to us, uh, whoa, 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 hold on, not so fast. You have work to do as we await our resurrection. This, this whole section really begins in chapter 15, verse 58. So I want you to look at that verse and it'll kind of set the context for all, all that's going to come in, in a rather disjointed passage as we, as we end this letter. So chapter 15, verse 58, Paul says, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully. And I want you to notice this phrase. It's the phrase for this morning. The work of the Lord. Because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. The work of the Lord. Verse 9, Paul says, a door for effective work has been opened to me. Verse 10, talking about Timothy, he says, Timothy is carrying on the work of the Lord. Verse 16, to everyone who joins in this work and labors in it. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, Paul says that we have been created in Christ Jesus to do what? Good works. And so the question that we have to ask is, what in the world are these good works? 
So I, I was employed here as a pastor for uh, just a couple of years. And um, sometimes people would say to me, Steve, what, what are you doing this week? Or what are you doing today? And, you know, it, sometimes it's hard to explain what you do. And so I kind of had a, a, a standard response that I thought was funny. I, I don't know if they did. But, and when they would say, what are you doing this week? Or what are you doing today? I'd always just say, hey, I'm doing the work of the Lord, which was very ambiguous. So what is the work of the Lord? I had a friend of mine who um, his whole life he wanted to be a cattle rancher, but he really didn't have any experience in cattle ranching. He was a businessman and uh, wore nice clothes and went to business meetings and dealed with a lot of big numbers and that sort of thing. And, and at one point in his life, he figured out how to get out of that life and uh, buy the cattle ranch and go to the mountains and raise cows. And he did that. And he, he told me that the, doing this was exhausting, getting rid of his business. He had a, a home to sell, moving uh, across the country to an area where cattle ranching would work, uh, his kids, everything else, buying this ranch. And he said the first morning after all this exhausting work, he woke up, he was so excited, and he walked outside and he looked at his cattle ranch and he had absolutely no idea what to do. He had no experience. He didn't even have cows. He had to go buy his first set of cows and, so they could make babies and make more cows and in and out Burger and all the rest. You know how it goes. <clears throat> Do you feel that way sometimes as a Christian? I'm born again. I know Jesus. I've been forgiven. Really stoked to know the Lord. Now what am I supposed to do? Well, we could spend months, months talking about that, but since we're a Bible church, we're just going to look at chapter 16, and Paul answers that question, what is the work of the Lord, in two ways. First of all, to care for other believers materially through giving, and then secondly, to care for other believers spiritually through relationships. So that's what we're going to look at here. We've got work to do. Let's dig in. Uh, we can see it there in the first four verses where Paul instructs the church at Corinth and also us how to care for other believers materially through giving. Verse 1, now about the collection for God's people. Do what I told the Galatian churches to do, and Galatia would be uh, present-day Western Turkey. Think, think in that terms. Uh, on the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Then when I arrive, I will give letters of introduction to the men you approve and send them with your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable for me to go also, they will accompany me. So four pretty simple verses that give us a lot of help on how to care for other Christians materially through giving. Um, the background here is there has been a famine in kind of an ongoing famine in Jerusalem and Judea, the southern part of Israel. If you were in your home group this week, you looked at Acts chapter 11, where Paul, way back in, in the beginning of the church, was trying to raise money from the church in Antioch. Antioch would be present-day Syria, a couple of hundred miles above Jerusalem. And the famine was ongoing at that point. That was 25 years before the passage we're reading today. And Paul is still concerned about the terrible situation in Jerusalem. Verse 1, do what I told the Galatian churches to do. So giving was a pattern in the early church right from the beginning. And he says, do it, what, that, what I told the Galatian churches to do. This is really nothing new. Or we might say, when, how? Well, the first day of the week, the Lord's Day. That's Sunday when believers gathered. And I believe that what Paul is telling us is that we do, as we do this work of giving, it's to be done intentionally. It's to be thought out. It's to be planned. It's to be purposeful. We don't just give when the Holy Spirit leads. Because part of the problem with money is the Holy Spirit never seems to lead when it comes to money, right? And so Paul says, I want you to think about this and plan it. If you just wait to see if you're moved by a couple of Andy's worship songs on how much you're going to give, you're going to kind of miss the point. First day of the week is Sunday, and it points to the fact that giving was an act of worship. Uh, two great chapters, if you're more interested in giving in the New Testament, are 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. But in 2 Corinthians 9, 12, Paul says this, this service that you perform of giving is not only supplying the needs of God's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to
to God. In other words, giving of our finances is worship. So I've got a question for you. How many of you think, maybe subconsciously, of your giving as paying the bills? Especially in this era where many of us do our giving. I I know Don and I do our giving through just an automatic deduction every two weeks. And so we're not writing a check or we're not putting any green cash in an envelope and putting it in a box. It just comes out of our checking account. So we have our gas bill and we have our electric bill and we have the trash bill and then we have uh, Cox Cable that we hate. Yeah. And then we have our giving to Santa Barbara Community Church. And sometimes in this era, it can feel like Well, it's just another bill. Oh, no, folks. We need to remember, first day of the week, it's an act of worship. And however you do this, I just want to encourage you to remind yourself that this is an act of worshiping God. Now, the big question, of course, is how much and who should do it? Verse 2 says, each one of you. Now, if you need to know the ins and outs of the Greek language, that means each one of you. In other words, it's kind of an all-inclusive phrase. And how much should we give? If you're thinking, is this, is this gross or is it net? Is it tax deductible? Is it 10% or 8% or 11% or whatever it is? If you're thinking along those terms, you've probably missed the point. Do you know in the New Testament, there is no mention of a percentage of what we should give. Only that giving should be done joyfully, generously, and in keeping with one's income. Wonderfully ambiguous, but I'll give you a little bit of an interpretation. I believe that the person who makes $200,000 a year should probably give a much larger percentage of their income for the work of the Lord as an act of worship than the person who makes $30,000 a year. The Paul is, is realistic in several places. He says our giving should be somehow commensurate with how much money we have and make. So how much do American evangelical Christians give? Ever wondered? You can think about your own life. Uh, they, pollsters say, and this is pretty accurate, that right now American born-again Christians give just a little bit above 2%. In the 60s, that number was about 7%, and it's going down. And every statistician says the richer somebody is, the more money they make, the more money they have invested, the less percentage they give. And the poorer people are, the more they give. I'll leave you to see what you should do with that. 2 Corinthians 9, 7, each of you should give what he's decided in his own heart to give. Not reluctantly or under compulsion, God loves what? Cheerful giver. If you're grumpy, keep it. God doesn't need your money to accomplish great kingdom purposes. But if you're grumpy and stingy, you will lose out on the joy of the work of the Lord in giving for his greater kingdom purposes. You know, churches do it so differently. I don't know how many of you saw our, our little uh, rectangular wooden box. Uh, you can put a gift in there. Many of you do it online, like I mentioned in, in our life that Don and I do. And, but churches do it differently. Pass a plate. That's actually a good thing. I think it, it highlights the fact that it's worship to do that on a Sunday uh, service for any church. But, you know, we've had a long standing, like 40 plus years relationship with the Church of God of uh, Tegucigalpa in Honduras. First budget item of our church. It's gone on for all these decades. It's just been fantastic. I've been down there twice. And I want you to know, Honduras, it's bleak. Uh, it, it's, that is a country is a mess. It's a mess economically. It's just really a tough situation. But the, our sister church ha, ha, really emphasizes giving. And I, I want to tell you a little what they do. They, they, when I was down there one time, they, they had a pledge where they wanted everybody in the church to say how much they were going to give that year. And then, uh, it, you know, it was your choice. And then they kind of kept track of it. And they, they had a wall in the church And there was a big piece of paper up on the wall as you came in, and it said how much you promised. So it would say, um, Ben Patterson and Loretta Patterson, $50 a month. And you could check to see if they gave that much last month. 
So I'm going to suggest that maybe we try that here. Uh, that'd go over really well, wouldn't it? Wow. The situation in Corinth is not unlike the situation that we are involved with in our sister church in Tegucigalpa, Honduras. I mean, the, the believers in Corinth, 99% of them would never meet the believers in Jerusalem, just as the vast majority of our church is never going to meet our brothers and sisters in Honduras. But we have the privilege to do the work of the Lord and participate in this giving. Okay, we got a little bit more work to do. What is the work of the Lord? It is to care through other believers through giving. Secondly, the work of the Lord is to care through other believers spiritually through relationships. Now, in the rest of the chapter, which is a little disjointed, and I'm just going to walk us through this, we see an example of how churches and individual Christians are spiritually interdependent and interrelated as they care for one another through spiritual relationships. So we're fond of saying here at Santa Barbara Community Church that the Christian life was never meant to be lived alone or in isolation, which undoubtedly makes a lot of the introverts here a little nervous. I want you to know it's going to be okay. God does not require you to change your personality to have relationships in the church. But as we go through this disjointed kind of section here at the end, I'm going to just read through it, make some comments. I want you to notice a couple of things. First of all, there are no less than five Roman provinces mentioned in chapter 16. Verse 1, Galatia. Verse 3, Judea. Verse 3, Macedonia. Verse 15, Achaia. Uh, verse 19, Asia. These are huge Roman provinces that are very different from one another culturally. The conditions, some were uh, more Eastern, some were more European. There's Jews and Arabs. There's Greeks and Gentiles urban and rural. From the very beginning, the church uh, was very diverse. It was a multi-ethnic, made up of all kinds of different congregations. And the church very quickly, after Acts 2, in the beginning of the church, became international. I always also want you to notice, and uh, this will be obvious as we go through this, that there are seven different individuals named, some of whom we really don't know anything about, along with kind of a longer list of what they'd simply refer to as the brothers. So there's a lot of people in this chapter. So let's take a look at it. Verse 5, this is a little bit about Paul's plans. He's got some plans, and he says this, After I go through Macedonia, think present-day Greece, I will come to you, for I will be going through Macedonia. Perhaps I'll stay with you for a while or even spend the winter so that you can help me on my journey wherever I go. I do not want to see you now and make only a passing visit. In other words, I don't want to just come for a day or two. I hope to spend some time with you, if the Lord permits. But I will stay on at Ephesus, that's where he's writing from, until Pentecost, because a great door for effective work, there's that word again, has opened to me, and there are many who oppose me. So Paul is in Ephesus, and he says, I'm going to come visit you again, but I'm going to wait till Pentecost. Pentecost is in the spring. So he's going to get through the winter, some bad weather and all the rest. And he says, I'm going to come and I'm not going to just come for a passing time. I'm going to come to spend time with you, a lot of time. So think how you'd feel when, you know, Aunt Susie from Illinois says, hey, I'm going to come for a visit, six months. <laughs> and you think, oh no. Well, that's kind of what's happening here. Paul is saying, I'm going to come and I want to spend a lot of time with you. Why? Because Paul wants to encourage, Paul wants to, to strengthen through relationship this church that has had so many struggles. Church life. So I listened to a fascinating podcast this week about a Scottish pastor. If you want to look this up, it's on The World and Everything in it, Marvin Olasky's interviews. And he interviewed a Scottish pastor who grew up in a horrible section of Scotland. This guy was a gangster. Think knives, guns, lots of drugs. Spent time in prison. Really bad. Really bad situation. And as he got out of a short-term prison stint as a very young man, a friend of his introduced him to Jesus. And he, this pastor said, man, I, in this wonderful Scottish accent, he said, I, I fell in love with Jesus. I fell in love with the Bible, but I couldn't stand the church. He said, what I thought was the church is, he says, you go into a building, pre-COVID, you go into a building, 
and you see a bunch of people that you don't know, and then you have to act like you like them, and then you go, go home and you don't see them for weeks or maybe months on end again. I hope nobody feels like that here. The church is full of difficult, as Maddie Hardiman just said a few minutes ago, some of the pain and hurt that she had in her life. But the church is full of imperfect, irregular people who are called to do the work of the Lord by spiritually walking alongside one another through spiritual relationships. Well, verses 10 and 11, we uh, get a little reference to Timothy. You remember Timothy is Paul's young protege, uh, his sidekick, if you will. And he says, Timothy, if Timothy comes, see to it that he has nothing to fear while he is with you. What a weird verse. He says, Timothy might show up, make sure that he's not afraid of you. We'll get to that in just a second. For he is carrying on, here's our phrase again, the work of the Lord, just as I am. No one then should refuse to accept him. Send him on his way in peace so that he may return to me. I'm expecting him along with the brothers. Wow. He's carrying on the work of the Lord. Now, why would Timothy be fearful of going to the church in Corinth? We don't really know. But here's my take. This is one weird church. This is a, a church that is not easy to get along with. They're immature. Paul has already called them babies. And Timothy, I think we can fairly deduce from the scriptures, was shy, young, possibly an introvert, very wonderful guy that, that was Paul's sidekick in ministry. And Paul says, don't chew this guy up. You know, let him come and let him minister to you, but send him back to me happy. Spiritual relationships, as everybody here knows, can be tricky. Verse 12, we come to another individual, the very gifted preacher, Apollos. But now about our brother Apollos. I strongly urge him to go to you with the brothers. So a group of guys. He was quite unwilling to go. <laughs> In other, he didn't want to go to Corinth. Who can blame him? And he says he was quite unwilling to go. But he will go when he has the opportunity. So we're not, again, we're not sure of all the situations. But he's coming to have a spiritual relationship of encouragement with these brothers. To care for each uh, believers uh, spiritually through relationships. Verses 13 through 18, we get a few more characters. Be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be men of courage, uh, be strong, do everything in love. You know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Achaia, and they devoted themselves to the service of the saints. I urge you, brothers, to submit such as these and to everyone who joins in the work and labors in it. Here again is that work of the Lord. I was glad when Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaeus arrived because they have supplied what was lacking from you. They refreshed my spirit and yours also. Such men deserve recognition." Look at verse 18 again. They refreshed my spirit and yours also. Refreshed is an emotional term. It means to be encouraged. And I want to ask you the question, what refreshes you? So let me tell you about one day on a vacation I had last summer. Don and I were in southwest Utah in the national parks and... Uh, hiking, and it was a very hot day in October, and we did a hike up the Escalante River, and river is maybe generous. It's more of a good-sized stream, probably uh, about that deep, crystal clear water, slow moving, and for the most part, a sandy bottom. So we start this hike, pretty good hike, and uh, it's hot and dusty, but we had to cross the river seven times. And every time we took our boots off and our socks off and walked through the river, we'd find ourselves kind of walking up the river because it was refreshing. With the return trip, we did seven more crossings of this small river, and it felt so good on this hot, dusty day to get your feet wet and to be in the water. We were refreshed. We got back to our car, and because we're very smart people, uh, we had an ice chest with cold drinks. And we sat at the edge of our car taking our, our shoes off and our, our socks and refreshed ourselves with a cold adult beverage. Refreshing. 
Then we got back to our campsite, which wasn't very far away, and we thought, this is a great time to take a nap. And so we went into the tent and took a nap, and we woke up what? Refreshed. Now, all of us know about physical refreshment. What I want us to grapple with for just a second is what does it mean to be spiritually refreshed and encouraged? 1 Thessalonians 5.11, therefore encourage one another and build each other up. 1 Thessalonians 3.2, we sent Timothy, here's Timothy again, who is our brother and God's fellow worker to strengthen and encourage you in your faith. So how do we do this? Could I just suggest that to refresh each other spiritually, to encourage one another, is to consistently, in a variety of ways, remind each other of the goodness of God, the great themes of the scriptures and of the Christian faith, of a bodily resurrection, of forgiveness from sin, of the assurance of a loving Father that cares for us on good days and bad days, and all of these wonderful themes. And as we talk this way to another, one another, we refresh one another, but we have to work at it. This week... Last, what was it, thir last, last Friday, I'm in my living room with three other guys having coffee. We get together, Wayne's one of them right here, and we're chatting, and we, uh, the four of us basically kind of solve the problems of the world when we talk and get it all figured out, but we, we had kind of a low moment where we're talking about the aggression of China, and North Korea is a mess, uh, the Russians are on the border with Ukraine, potential war, and then we, we our, our conversations just, you ever have conversations just go like this, down, 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 and all of a sudden then we're talking about our country and the, and the social uh, upheaval that we're experiencing right now, what an odd time in a divided country, and all of a sudden we're depressed and we're low and everything, you know, the world's going to hell in a handbasket and we're all upset, and one of our guys says, hey, isn't it great that God's sovereign? None of this mess that our world in surprises God. God has, he's got this one. He's in control, even though we don't get it. And we ended our morning from going from the depths to kind of the heights of, yeah, yeah, the Lord's in control. We're going to be okay, even though we don't understand it. We refreshed one another. How do we do this? We have to strategize. We have to think about it. Well, let's finish up our passage, verses 19 through the end. Uh, we're going to see a reference to uh, uh, Priscilla and Aquila, the husband-wife team that uh, show up often in the New Testament. The churches in the province of Asia send you greetings. Aquila and Priscilla greet you warmly in the Lord, and so does the church that meets at their house. Again, all this relationship. All the brothers here send you greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss, but keep your mask on. <laughs> Paul I, Paul, write this letter in my own hand. If anyone does not the lo love the Lord, a curse be on him. Come, O Lord, Maranatha, and the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. My love to all of you in Christ Jesus. Amen. What's verse 22 doing in there? If anyone does not love the Lord, a curse be upon him. My take is, Paul is giving one last dig at the trouble causers in Corinth who were apostate and leading the church away from Christ. And it, it's kind of one last way to just get them. But we see this, again, this wonderful emphasis on relationship, spiritual relationships that encourage and refresh. So one last question before we take the Lord's Supper. How do we know that our labor in the Lord, go back to verse 58, our work in the Lord is not in vain? How do we know that our giving materially is not just a joke and a waste of money? How do we know that our efforts at building each other up spiritually, of refreshing each other, of encouraging each other, how do we know it really works? Well, first of all, I would say because the scriptures say so. And Paul says unambiguously, your labor in the Lord is not in vain. This is going to have an eternal payoff. But let me just... Talk with you personally. You ever get discouraged about your work in the Lord, caring for others? Do you think sometimes, gosh, my, my efforts to disciple this person or to meet with them and encourage them and speak of God's love to them, it just seems like a waste. It doesn't seem like it's really making much of a difference. Do you ever for your prayers, 
really matter? I'm thinking of those who work with youth, teaching Sunday school, maybe young life. Does it really matter? I'm thinking of those of you who have maybe met faithfully with an individual to encourage them and love them towards Jesus for months or even years, only to see them kind of drift away. I'm thinking of those of you who lead small groups of all different varieties in our church and elsewhere. Is it worth it? I'm thinking of those of you who work with junior high students. Wow. You know, um, 45 years ago, I was a junior high pastor, and um, I think I was a pretty bad one <clears throat> as I reflect on it. I, I had one experience. I just had one of these things that came back to me. I, I went to San Marcos Christian Camp up by Cold Springs Tavern. Do you know where it is? Gorgeous camp. Uh, two weeks ago, I went to pick up my grandson, Tully, who was there with a bunch of the high school students. And as I came in, I hadn't been there in ages. I almost had a panic attack because it brought back a horrible memory from 45 years ago. You want to hear about it? I know you do, yeah. So 45 years ago, a very dumb junior high youth pastor announced to all the junior high kids who were going to have an overnight up at San Marcos Christian Camp, and I wanted to get a lot of kids to go, and I thought, I promised them they could all stay up all night if they wanted to. Yeah, yeah, some, I mean, I'd been to seminary, but I was still stupid. And I had a lot of adult sponsors there to help and stuff, but I, I'm not kidding you, it, by about 12.30 at night, 90 junior high kids hopped up on candy, running around the hills in the, in the darkness. And uh, it was like Lord of the Flies. I'm, I'm not kidding you. It was absolutely unbelievable. And the adult sponsors are furious with me. And now the kids hate me because at 1245, uh, we started rounding up and say, we're going back on the promise you can uh, be out all night. You got to get in your cabin now and shut up and we're going home tomorrow morning. It was a disaster. <laughs> God has been gracious enough in my life to let me live just long enough to see that sometimes our labor in the Lord is not in vain. Because some of those junior high kids are now in their 50s. <laughs> oh. And I know them. And some of them still love Jesus. Our labor in the Lord is not in vain. What is the work of the Lord, at least from 1 Corinthians 16? It's to care for other believers materially through giving, and it's to care for other believers spiritually through relationships that refresh and encourage. And one of the beauties of looking at a passage like this for a few minutes is that every person, young, old, regardless of your station in life, can leave here today and implement at least these two areas in your life, in your own way, as God directs, but this is such a, a wonderful passage to put into practice beginning immediately. Well, verse 23, the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. And grace and God's forgiveness is at the very center of the Christian life that it enables us to do the work of the Lord. And to remind ourselves of God's grace, I want you to take bread and wine and uh, take your little container we're going to remind ourselves that on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and wine and gave them special meaning. He took the bread and he passed it around to some of his followers, the disciples, and he said, this is my body. Eat. Let's eat. After dinner... Jesus passed around wine, and he said, this represents my blood, the new covenant. Do this as often as you do it in remembrance of me, of the great grace that has been given to you, the blood of Christ. Jesus, we're so thankful for your amazing sacrifice that allows us to live we are thankful that forgiveness and grace is at the very center of the Christian life. And because of the freedom we experience through that grace, we have the ability to do imperfectly 
with your power, the work of the Lord. What a gift. As we await your return, Christ, and our new bodies, resurrected bodies, and a glorious eternity with you, we're thankful that we're not just sitting around twiddling our thumbs, but we have the ability to be involved in this great kingdom work. Oh, Lord, help us. Help us individually and help us as a church. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Steve. We're so grateful for your teaching. And as a parent, I'm so, so grateful that God called you out of youth ministry. (laughs) Sorry. Love you, buddy. (laughs) Why don't you stand and join us in worship? We're going to put our masks back on and and respond to this um, amazing time we've had to think about how God calls us to his work. Come now, fount of every blessing, to my heart to sing thy days streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise teach me some melodious song sung by flaming tongues above praise his name I'm fixed upon it Name of God's redeeming love. Hitherto thy love has blessed me, thou hast brought me to this place, and I know thy hand will bring bound by thy good grace. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger, brought me with his precious blood. to grace how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be let thy goodness like a fetter by my wandering heart to thee to wander Lord I feel it prone to leave the God I love here's my Seal it, seal it for thy courts of love. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. He's my heart. Take and seal it, seal it for thy courts of Take my voice and let me sing Always only for my King Take my lips and let them be Filled with messages from Thee Take my silver and my gold Not a mite would I withhold Take my intellect and use Every power as you choose 
church, we're going to receive the benediction. I picked a couple of verses that really stood out to me from, from chapter 16. Steve suggested the Holy Kiss one, but I'm, I'm going to go with uh, verses 13 and 14. 
And I'm going to read these in two different translations here. I got the NIV, and then I'm going to follow up with the message. So here we go. Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. And do everything in love. And in the message, it says, keep your eyes open. Hold tight to your convictions. Give it all you've got. Be resolute and love without stopping. Amen, church. Have a great week.